This is now really my favorite part of the course. We're going to look at several different market structures. We're going to think about these as models for the way different markets might work. And this is going to be a very helpful thing for you as you think about how exactly are prices determined, what happens in the market, why are, you know, what affects prices, all those kind of questions. So in this section, we're going to look at uh, perfectly competitive markets. And over the next couple of modules here, we'll take a look at these various different kinds of markets in order of decreasing competitiveness. So perfectly competitive markets, obviously the most competitive. And these different models are going to be applicable in different situations. So here's a basic overview of the four market structures. You don't have to know all this right now, but this is definitely going to be something you're going to want to know and be able to talk about, uh, say, for your uh, quizzes and your, your final. Um, right now we're looking at lots of firms selling an identical product. It's very easy for new firms to enter the market. And with this, a lot of times you'll think about agricultural products. So there's not a lot of difference in different kinds of wheat, for example, you know, uh, setting aside organic versus non-organic, those kind of questions. But if you're just thinking about wheat, it's just wheat or say poultry farming, right? So lots of buyers and sellers, identical product, easy to enter the market. And uh, agriculture is going to be the typical example you're going to think of. For these other markets, we'll look at these more as we go along. Uh, monopolistic comp competition shares some features of competition and some of monopoly. And we'll also take a look at oligopoly later on. So right now, perfect competition. So like I said, uh, many buyers and sellers, identical products, no barrier barriers to entry. Um, and so these two conditions right here, we're going to call our firms price takers. That means that an individual firm cannot affect the market price. So remember with the analogy of the scissors, supply and demand here, we're saying that the individual firms have to take the market price as determined by market supply and market demand as given. So the individual individual firm is just such a small part of the market, they can't affect it. So this is a, a rare situation, but it's a very important uh, starting point theoretically, and it's, it's also pretty robust. Uh, the giving you the tools to think about how the market's going to work. So individual firm can affect the market price. Think about agriculture. So if you are an individual seller, say in the agricultural market, you're selling wheat. Um, here is the market price that's given. And since you're just a small player in this market, you cannot do anything to affect this $7 market price. So if you sell 6,000 bushels or if you sell 15,000 bushels, you're facing a ho perfectly horizontal demand curve, a perfectly elastic demand curve. If you were to try to sell your wheat at a higher price, you're not going to sell anything. You could sell your wheat at a lower price, but why would you do that if you're profit maximizing, right? You're, you're trying to um, maximize profit, so you're going to sell at the highest price that is, that is feasible, which is the market price. But you cannot affect the market price no matter how much you sell. So here's another illustration of exactly what I was saying. The, the market price for wheat is determined by the market demand and the market supply for wheat. So if you just come across straight across from this market determined price, that gives us this $7 and that gives us um, anywhere this individual wheat farmer sells, all they can do is sell at uh, is $7. So the demand curve for the firm, notice, is horizontal. It is perfectly elastic. The market demand is downward sloping. So individual sellers, all of those added up are right here in this huge number. So whatever this is, seven or 15,000, that is just one part of this market quantity. So a lot of times you'll see market quantity labeled with a capital Q and the individual quantity la labeled with a lowercase Q over here. So takes the individual farmer has to take the market price as given. Our assumption throughout all of these various models is that the firms, each firm is trying to maximize profits. Even the perfectly competitive one, remember profit, is going to be total revenue minus total cost. Total revenue is just P times Q, uh, the price that the good is sold for times the quantity sold. Total cost, remember, includes implicit costs and explicit costs. So all those added up, that difference between total revenue and total cost is profit. Revenue for a competitive firm is easy. Like I said, that was just total revenue here is P times Q. Um, and the firm receives the same amount of money for every unit of output that it sells. That'll be different as we go forward looking at monopoly, monopolistic competition. But in this case, because the individual demand curve for the firm is horizontal, 
it's always the same price times whatever the quantity is. So that rectangle under the individual demand curve is just total revenue for the firm. In the case of perfect competition, price is going to be equal to average revenue and equal to marginal revenue. Uh, remember, these average and marginals are just like what we've calculated previously when we've seen average and marginal over again and again. Average is total revenue divided by the quantity of the product sold. Marginal is that change in the total revenue from selling one more unit. So one more unit additional, that's marginal. So you want to be familiar, uh, comfortable with being able to fill in this chart, for example, like I said, the market price for imperfect competition is equal to average revenue, is equal to marginal revenue, but you want to be able to calculate these using the definitions for average revenue and marginal revenue. I've skipped through the charts, but like I said, you need to be comfortable with everything that's going on here. I wanted to get to the graphs so I could explain this a little bit more. So this is graphing now total revenue and total cost. So remember the goal here is to maximize profit by choosing the appropriate level of output. So looking at total revenue, P times Q, and total cost, which includes explicit and implicit cost, that difference is our profit. So as we're maximizing profit, profit is going to be greatest when this vertical distance between total revenue and total cost is the largest. So this distance right here, right? So as you see, the distance is increasing up to here, and then it starts falling again. So at this point, at this quantity, that is going to be the profit maximizing quantity. That vertical distance, total profit. So that was total cost and total revenue. Uh, typically the way that we're going to think about maximizing profit is going to be looking at marginal revenue and marginal cost. This is the, the profit maximizing rule where marginal revenue equals marginal cost. Okay, so remember marginal revenue is the additional dollar of revenue, additional amount of revenue that you get from increasing your quantity. Marginal cost is the additional cost you incur from an additional unit of production. So where marginal revenue is above marginal cost, that is going to be a positive to our profit, right? We're adding this vertical distance to our profit at one unit, adding this vertical distance, adding this vertical distance. So as long as marginal revenue is above marginal cost, we're going to keep increasing our quantity until we get to the point where marginal revenue just equals marginal cost. So in this case, at six, marginal revenue is still a little bit above marginal cost. We would go right here a little bit farther to whether where they're just equal. If we can choose partial uh, sizes here in our quantity. So we would go right here where marginal revenue just equals marginal cost. That corresponds to that where that vertical distance between total revenue and total cost is greatest. So the individual firm can affect the price, but it can choose its quantity. And so we're going to choose that quantity right here where marginal revenue equals marginal cost. So for maximizing profit, we're thinking about the difference between total revenue and total cost being the greatest. So that's, of course, our very definition for profit. So that's this first point here. The second point, we can also see that profit maximizing level of output is where MR equals MC, where marginal revenue just equals marginal cost. If, if marginal cost becomes greater than marginal revenue, we're producing too much. We need to back off of production a little bit. This is going to be the same profit maximizing rule for every firm that we look at, where, mar where marginal revenue equals marginal cost. That is the profit maximizing um, rule. Okay, in the case of perfectly competitive firms, we also have one extra simplifying step that's not going to hold for the other cases, but it is true here. For perfectly competitive firms, price is going to be the same as marginal revenue. Because remember, we have that for the um, individual firm, we have the horizontal demand curve. So price, the, the individual firm can affect price, and that is going to be the same as marginal revenue for the individual firm in perfect competition. So we can simplify this rule only in the case of perfect competition to have P equals MC. Just so long as price is above marginal cost, we're going to continue expanding output until the point where price just equals marginal cost. Total revenue minus total cost, that is our definition for profit. Total revenue, like I said, is just P times Q. Here's total cost. If we divide everything by Q, we get average revenue right here. P times Q over Q, average revenue. That's why average revenue, these Qs are going to cancel. That's why average revenue is just our price for perfect competition. So this is just, that just simplifies to the P. TC over, over Q is our average total cost. If we multiply this times our Q right here, we can see our profit. The reason we want to do this is because it makes it very straightforward when we're looking at a graph. So, uh, 
you need to be very comfortable with these graphs, figure out what's going on. What is the profit? What would a profit maximizing firm do in perfect competition? So your first thing is where marginal revenue equals marginal cost. That's always the rule. In the case of perfect competition, it's where price equals marginal cost. So you go through, here's our market price. The individual firm takes it as given. Where it equals marginal cost here, that is going to be our profit maximizing level of output. Notice right here, if we continue increasing output from right here, marginal cost is going to fall. So we don't want this point. We want this point right here. So that's the first thing you do. Uh, the demand curve for the individual firm in perfect competition is marginal revenue. It is average revenue and it's also price. So this is P equals demand equals average revenue equals marginal revenue. That's all determined by the market. So here's our profit maximizing quantity right here. And now here is our average total cost curve. So if we want to calculate uh, our profit, let's see what we have here. So this is this rectangle right here. This is why we were doing that stuff on the last slide, P minus ATC times Q. So it's this, um, the difference between we want to go at this quantity up to right here on our ATC curve, all right, and this rectangle right here is going to be our profit. So P times Q would be this whole rectangle, which would be total revenue minus total cost. That's all we're doing right here. Our total cost, we want to be at this quantity up to our average total cost. ATC times Q at this quantity, that gives us total cost. So we have this big rectangle for total revenue minus this a little bit smaller rectangle for total cost. That leaves us our profit. So that's how we get this green rectangle, total revenue minus total cost, or in this formulation like we just did on the last slide. When we say the firm is choosing its profit maximizing level of output, that doesn't mean that the firm is necessarily making a profit. It could be, then that's that's fine. That's the cases we've been looking at. But if it's going to make a loss, it also wants to make the smallest loss possible. So that's also going to fall under the umbrella of maximizing profit. So in either case, it's always going to be marginal revenue just equal to marginal cost. In perfect con competition, where price is just equal to marginal cost, that's also going to be the loss minimizing level of output. So profit maximization includes a positive profit, zero profit, and also negative profit, a loss. In this case, where marginal revenue equals marginal cost, we have this quantity, and this is a zero profit, right? So P times Q would be this whole rectangle times our average cost is uh, is the same rectangle, so zero profit. This is just the break-even point. The firm is doing the best it can by producing right here, even though it's not making any economic profit. The same holds true. We're using the same rule if the firm is making a loss. Here, where marginal revenue equals marginal cost, we're right here. This is the quantity. So this rectangle right here is our total revenue. But if we go up from Q to our average total cost, this larger rectangle is our total cost. So we have a negative profit rectangle right here above the price line, uh, demand line. So this firm is making a loss. But still, the best the firm can do is to produce where marginal cost equals marginal revenue. So you need to find the firm's profit maximizing level of output. Then you're going to need to be able to figure out, is the firm making a profit, breaking even, or making a loss? So look through those graphs on the last page. You should be very comfortable with each of these scenarios. Just because a firm is making a loss, that doesn't mean that it's going to shut down. If it's making a loss, it could continue to produce, or it could stop production by shutting down temporarily. If it shuts down, it still has to pay its fixed costs. Remember, those are costs that the firm has to pay no matter how much it produces. So we're going to ignore sunk costs, uh, the fixed costs or sunk costs, because they have to be paid no matter what. Even if the firm doesn't produce, it still has to pay them. And so the shutdown point that we're going to look at is going to be dependent on our average variable cost. Because So we're ignoring fixed costs, which are sunk. Uh, we, no matter what, we can't avoid them. But we can have some control uh, over our variable costs. So the, the relationship between the price line and the average variable cost is going to be what determines whether a firm actually produces or whether it shuts down. As long as price is above average variable cost, average variable cost, then this rule that we've been looking at is going to is going to apply. If this is true, this is what the firm is going to do. If price falls below average variable cost, then the firm chooses to shut down in the in the short run. So, if if this if this condition holds, the firm will produce and that marginal cost curve above this point is the firm's mar is the firm's supply curve. So graphically, here's what I just said. If the price falls below this line, the firm is going to shut down. At this point, the firm's indifferent. All the, all the way below ATC here, any of these prices, the firm is taking a loss. But it continues to produce so long as price is at least this much. 
If it's down here, the firm shuts down, it does not produce in the short run. Another big part of this section you need to know is the long run equilibrium in perfect competition. Profit and loss do not persist. Firms enter and leave. Look through those graphs, be very comfortable with those, and look at long run market supply curves as well.